Hey, hey, good morning. We're going to sing together. Come on. Come now, found. Come now, fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnets, some by flaming tongues above. Praise a mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I've come And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God to rescue me from danger, interpose his precious blood. O oh, to grace, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord. Like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wander, prone to wander, to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Welcome to our online service. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will be leading worship today because Pastor Jason is off in California on a magical trip with Heather to move in their son to college and to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. Jason, Heather, I hope you're having a great time in California and that God is blessing your trip in awesome ways. But let's start by confessing our sins to God, our Father. God has plans for our lives, desires for how we live our life that not only glorify and honor him, but bless others. His greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And we know that we have fallen short of this great command. So let's take a moment in prayer to confess our sins before God. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and mercy, and so we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We've sinned against you by what we have done, by our active rebellion against you and your will, and by what we have left undone, the unfulfilled potential of following you and doing life your way. God, for many of us, this has created cycles in our lives that lead to more and more sin, death, destruction, joylessness, depression, and separation from you. So we take a moment here today in the quiet of our hearts or out loud wherever we are watching this to confess our sins to you, to get on the same page as you and tell you what it is in our lives that has blocked us off from you so that things can be made right. 
Let's take a moment to confess our sins together. Whatever you might have prayed, um, whatever you might have confessed, just know that because of Jesus Christ, who came to earth, died on a cross and rose again for you, because of his atoning death for you, God can, does, and wants to forgive you of all your sins. So through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the mercy of God, I declare forgiveness for your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, gives the power to become the children of God and gives to you the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Your sins are forgiven. With that, we're going to move into a time of prayer for our church. But I do want to give, say something special at this time. We have just started an email address, prayer.graciousaviorchurch at gmail.com. And whatever prayer request you may have, you can email it to that email address. Now, I know some of you are used to emailing or calling or texting but through this way, we can have all the prayers in one place. You can mark your prayers confidential. You can say, hey, no, this is a public prayer. I, I want a lot of people to pray for this. Or you can even say that this prayer is just for one person or our staff. If the prayer needs some level of discussion, just let us know if we can't tell already because of the prayer itself. So go ahead and in this next section, send us an email, prayer.graciousaviorchurch at gmail.com. But with that, Let's pray together for the prayers that our community of believers really needs God to, to attend to at this moment. Father God, we pray for the family of Campbell Sullivan, a young woman who passed away this week, and for Tom Danchek's mom, Alice, who is in hospice. We pray for Carrie Cool's mom undergoing chemotherapy for Nancy Denton. We pray that she is doing well after her next surgery. Pray for Mark recovering from back surgery and Tane healing from a badly broken leg. Tom Duncan's sister Susie battling cancer, and we pray that you would heal Susie and continue to sustain her and her family. Pray for Scott Bloom's brother battling cancer. Pray for our world and coronavirus. We pray that the end that we see on the horizon is not in vain. And we pray for the expediency and the effectivity and the safety of the vaccine. Father, we pray for those struggling with financial challenges. We pray for those struggling with addictions. We pray for Sal, the grandson of Pastor Dan and Kathy, who has been diagnosed with leukemia, as well as, as Stephanie Collar battling cancer. God, we pray for a family going through a challenging time in our congregation. We pray that your grace would bring this family closer together in your grace and love. And God, we express thanksgiving again for you providing us a place to worship and a community of believers to follow you together with. And we pray a prayer for thanksgiving for Larry Yaus, John Warnke, Kayla Bloom, and Larry Kavanaugh. We thank you, God, for your gift of life. And now to finish this time of prayer, let's pray together the way Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. like you do 
God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. of Gracious Savior Church, where we love Jesus, each other, and all people. Here are a few ways we can accomplish the mission together. I'm Josh. And I'm Matt. And we are the youth leaders at Gracious Savior Church. Every Wednesday, we host a youth night, fun experience for middle and high schoolers. We have food, fun and games, and quality time following Jesus together. Contact one of us to learn more. Hi, I'm Andrea, and I am a small group leader here at Gracious Savior. This year we are walking through the story, a version of the Bible that is edited for only the essential narrative of God's redemptive plan for his people. We have started several small groups, both in person and online, so join one of them as your schedule permits. Sign up for a group and get your free copy of the book. You can do so at the table just outside the sanctuary or on our website, graciousavior.org. Hi, my name is Janie Kleiber. I'm a volunteer for our Grief Share groups at Gracious Savior. Grief Share is a grief support group for anyone who is recovering from the loss of a loved one. If you or someone you know needs love, support, and care, then we want to encourage you to come to one of our sessions. We host Grief Share here at the church every Monday night at 530. All are welcome, and we hope you can find the support you need. 
Hi, I'm Bev Christensen, the prayer and senior ministry leader here at Gracious Savior. Every Thursday night at six o'clock, we have our prayer group. Everyone is welcome. Come if you would like to pray, be prayed for, or to grow in prayer. This ski season, we have the pleasure of joining up with Mountaintop Services. What that means is that we will be hosting small church services Sunday afternoons beginning at 12.30 on the following dates, January 24th, February 14th, March 7th, and March 28th. These services will be held in Beaver Creek just by Spruce Saddle. So reserve those days on your Epic app or online, and we would love to see you there at 12.30 on one or all of those dates. Can't wait to see you there and worship God with you and His creation. Holy Week is coming up, and we will be hosting a Good Friday service, a reflective meditative service on what it means for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins on Friday, April 2nd at 7 p.m. We will have online and in-person options for this service and for our Easter service, which is Sunday, April 4th at 7 a.m., 9 a.m., and 10.30 a.m. Normal years, we would have you bring food, but this year we will be providing coffee and donuts for everyone. If you feel called to support our ministry financially, you can do so through one of three ways. Our website, graciousavior.org, or our Gracious Savior Church Venmo account, or you can give a physical offering at one of our two offering boxes. There's one by the exit out of the sanctuary and one by the exit out of the whole building. Giving is by no means an obligation, and you should only give if you feel called to. What it does do is enable us to fulfill God's mission in this valley. So thank you so much for your faithful giving. It really has helped us love Jesus, each other, and all people. You good yeomen whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, training upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry, England and St. George! Good morning, and welcome to our online service. That video you just saw was from King Henry V. Actually, the 1944 movie production of Shakespeare's play, King Henry V. Now, King Henry V, on the surface, it seems like a great story, especially when we consider that Shakespeare made a lot of tragic plays that really didn't have a happy ending. In fact, I'm reminded of a professor of mine in college who said, you know how you can tell a tragedy? You know what the definition of a tragedy is? A story where nobody wins. And King Henry V is no different because the thing is, is that at the end of that play, the scene that you just saw is actually pretty close to that point. It's the, it's the climax of it. it. It decides the direction of the rest of the story. King Henry V wins. He, he takes over France. He beats them at the Battle of Agincourt. And he does so with a patriotic cry of, once more into the breach, dear friends. It's this epic battle scene, and it ends with blood and, and grit and guts and, and victory. But at the very end of the play, a character tells us what happens after the play is over. And he says, and then King Henry VI took over England, and he lost France. And the people bled, the country bled. The story actually has a sad ending after the happy ending. Hmm. A little strange, a little different whenever we compare it to stories of today. See, the thing is, is that King Henry V is a tragedy in a sense because what happens after the, all the victory that was so hard won by the previous generation is lost by that generation's children. And so the thing is, is this happens not only in our lives, but in our story chapter from today. See, the story chapter is chapter eight. A few good men and women too. And it's taken almost entirely from the book of Judges. And it talks about the content of that book in our Bible. 
Now, the book of Judges takes place right after Joshua dies. Joshua was a really brave leader of Israel. He was super faithful, and he won a lot of land in the promised land. Now, remember, the promised land is the land that was promised to Abraham. This is where his children would fill up an area of land that God had, had told them was theirs, the promised land. And Joshua had won most of it. And then he dies. And then the next generation comes up after him and they try to win the land, but they make some compromises. And that's when the tragedy begins. See, the thing is, just like Henry V, we might look at the book of Judges or may really a lot of the Bible and say, hmm, this is a patriarch story of exciting battles and action heroes that's read mostly for entertainment and to record heroes of the faith. But that would be, I believe, an incorrect way to look at it. Or we might say, this is, this is a call to action for, for us to stand up for ourselves and, and defeat our enemies. And that's not true either. The book of Judges isn't a story about heroes that we should emulate. Samson, Gideon, Jeff Thath, that's a fun one. And it's not a list of historical events, although these things really did happen. It's not a list of historical events that are just a record of things that happened that were really impressive. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. And so then let's dive into that tragedy real quick. The thing is, the book of Judges conveniently gives us a summary of the book of Judges. And not at the end, but at the beginning, at the very beginning of the book in the second chapter. This is how that summary goes from page 102 of the story. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Those are pagan gods. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hands of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges, not courtroom judges, think tribal chieftains, who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. So the Israelites, again, have the promised land in their grasp, but they make a few compromises. And those compromises start with them subjugating the Canaanites. Remember, this is the land of Canaan. It's full of Canaanites. And they are really evil people. And we can say that because we know that they practice child sacrifices and just an incredibly morally corrupt religious and social system that oppressed the weak and lifted up the strong, often in very explicitly violent or sexual ways. So God said, these people have got to go because I won't let them corrupt my holy people, the Israelites. Not the other Israelites are honestly much better, but they're God's chosen people and he wants to protect them morally. But as the Israelites are going, conquering one land after another, they keep on making compromises. And it either looks like them letting Canaanites get away who betray other Canaanites and they're like, your reward is you get to go. And they go start their own new Canaanite culture or they take a lot of them and subjugate them as slaves. Does this sound familiar? It should, because that's what the Israelites, ha that's what happened to them in Egypt. That's what the Egyptians did to the Israelites. They subjugated them. That's not how God's people are supposed to act. It's like if 
you told your child, hey, don't do this, but then you immediately did this. And then whenever your child does it, you're like, why are you, oh, it's just a repeat of a cycle. Except what if what you were doing was explicitly wrong and your children are doing the same thing? It'd be very concerning. And the thing is, is the children of Israel, they're learning this from their past. They're learning this from Egypt. So it starts with that compromise. And then we get the cycle that we just read about in the story. We get this cycle of the Israelites turn away from God. They prostitute themselves to Canaanite gods, to the Baals and the Ashtoreths. And then they're subjugated by the people around them. God allows them to be plundered and raided by groups around them. Then the Israelites cry out for help. They cry out and they repent and they weep. They ask God, please save us from our subjugators. And God does. And he uses extremely flawed people. And he does not necessarily condone their actions. Notice that God is not condoning these judges' actions. He's using them to save his people because he's promised to save his people. But it's not much longer after the judge dies that the people go back to their old ways. The cycle just goes over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it's at this point in the tragedy that we might be asking ourselves, okay, so when's the good part? When does some leader come up and save them all and, 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 and make everything good again? Well, that's us thinking with our 21st century brain and us having consumed media and stories and, and American myths, stories that define who we are as a culture, that are very different than the Israelites. Let me give you an example. In the recent Marvel movies, there was a movie called Infinity War. And this movie was an epic collection of, I can't remember how many, well over a dozen previous movies and characters and ideas and concepts that came into one huge climactic moment. Thanos, he's purple with a very ugly looking chin, Thanos is this super powerful being, and his one goal is to collect the set of magical stones. If he gets them, he will wipe away half the universe. All life in the universe, he'll divide it by half. It's at this moment, right before he snaps his fingers, that Thor, one of the main heroes of the story, comes in and and slashes into his chest with his ax. And Thanos turns to him and says, the head. We see famous characters and figures from this story dissipating into ash. The bad guys win. There's no coming back from this. Pretty close to a proper tragedy, right? Pretty close, but not close enough. Because you see, those Marvel's movies, they, they, they have this habit of having a credit scene and then an end credit scene. So there will be a little snippet, about maybe 30 seconds to a minute of footage after the credits are over, and it will tell another part of the story or a different story. And in that movie, what happens is one of the characters, he is, starts disappearing into ash, and the last thing he does is get out an old 90s pager and press a button. And then the symbol on this button comes up. And if you're a comic book nerd like me, you recognize it as the symbol for Captain Marvel. She is the super awesome cosmic superhero woman who's going around in the galaxy saving entire planets from ruined destruction. If anyone can save the day, it's her. And ultimately her and a lot of people around her save the day in the next movie. So even in the movie about the tragedy, because of our culture and our 21st century minds, and we're so used to a happy ending or a redemption of some kind, even then we can't resist but giving them this little seed of hope. The book of Judges gives us no such seed of hope. It is a true and proper tragedy. 
The cycle continues and continues and continues and continues. And the last four chapters are some of the most disturbing in the entire Bible. I do not recommend you reading them to your kids. And the story book that we're using graciously kind of skims over it and tells us what we need to know. But it paints a picture of tragedy and cyclical depravity. And it encapsulates it in this one sentence. It's repeated three times towards the end of the book. The first two times, it's exactly the same. In those days, Israel had no king. And then, boom, a terrible tragedy. It does it again. In those days, Israel had no king. And then, boom, a terrible tragedy. And the last phrase of the book is, in those days, Israel had no king, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And then the book ends. Now, there is a little seed of hope. Because it, if you know your Bible, you know that the next book is First and Second Samuel, the story about Israel getting a king. And that sounds like there's a little hopeful thing. In those days, Israel had no king. Well, maybe they'll get a king. But here's the thing. That tragedy is actually made even worse by that line, not better. Because Israel had a king. His name was Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God who by his spirit reigns and rules through Jesus Christ and through you and me. But they rejected him. It was as if Israel had no king to begin with. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. Then the book ends. So here's the question we should really ask ourselves. What is Judges supposed to do to us? Every book of the Bible is intended to have an effect on the reader of some kind. These books do not exist in a vacuum. And in fact, there's this whole branch of books in the Bible called the historical books. But to say that their purpose is just to be a record of things that happened is frankly a little insulting to the authors of the Bible because these stories were written in such a style and in such a way and certain focuses and poetries that they intend to have an effect on you. And the story, the book that we're using, the story, has the same purpose. They're quoting and, and, and paraphrasing and using it and in these books to have an effect on you. And what is that effect? What is the book of Judges supposed to do to us? Well, it is supposed to disturb us. That's what ancient tragedy does. It paints a picture, a tragic picture, where nobody wins in bold terms so that it sits with us. So it's supposed to affect us. It's supposed to disturb us. It's supposed to make us angry and indignant and uncomfortable and a little depressed. And then it doesn't let go. It it, it, it crawls into our skin and into our heart. And then by the time we get to the end of the book, we get that last line. In those days, Israel had no king and every man was did, did what was right in his own eyes. So the thing is, is that it's supposed to leave us with that question and we're supposed to ask ourselves, Israel had no king and every, what does that mean? That's what the book is supposed to do to us. And every book of the Bible doesn't just do something to you. It asks what you will do in response. How are you going to respond to the text? Application isn't good enough. It doesn't want to know, how does this apply to your life? It wants to know, how are you going to make your life apply to this? How are you going to change your life because of what you just read? So how are we going to change our life knowing that we're about to spend a week, and that's chiefly what the sermon is about, is to prepare you to read this chapter of the book. How are we going to spend a week reading this, and then what are we going to do afterwards? Well, let me help you out by giving you a hint. The absolute first thing we should do whenever reading the Bible is be thankful for our Lord Jesus Christ. We should be thankful Think back to that Avengers scene. Nick Fury, the, the guy with the pager, he falls down and uh, goes into ash. 
but he's pressed a button and then that logo comes up. You have this hopeful moment of, oh, Captain Marvel, oh, that's right. We as Christians get to view the whole story and see Jesus, our true superhero, who defeats evil once and for all and promises us forgiveness. That's the first thing we should do is remember the hope we have in Jesus. Not to diminish the tragedy and feelings of depravity that we get in this book, but to put it in perspective and remember, I have hope and I have salvation in Jesus Christ. But the thing is, is so the, the story of the Bible is a story of God redeeming broken people. God bringing people back to life, morally, literally, etc. Not just morally, but, but just their whole self. So the story has to do two things. It has to show God's redeeming love. And it has to show the brokenness of people. So whenever we read a book of the Bible with Jesus in mind and his redeeming love, we might be shorting that redeeming love if we don't pay attention to the brokenness. So, we should pay attention to the cycle of judges. I trust God, I follow him, someone in my life helps me trust him, but then once that goes away, I get worse than I ever was before. And then I'm subjugated, maybe not by a nation, but by sin, by myself. And then I call out to God and he responds in love and I'm delivered and oh, thank God. But then I go back down again. So the book of Judges wants to bring that to your mind and you should respond by truly analyzing your life and asking yourself, are there cycles in my life that are like the book of Judges? Truly looking and seeing. Look and be honest and remember, that cycle starts with a small compromise. For the Israelites, it was letting a few guys go or subjugating this people or that people. They're just gonna die anyway, let's make them slaves. What compromises are going on in our lives that the book of Judges is calling us to pay attention to and to correct? Are we making compromises with how we run our families? How we run our marriages? We're making compromises by the little decisions where we take our phone and just boop, 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 oh, five more minutes, boop, 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 whenever there's an entire world around us that's calling for us to pay attention. We're making compromises by the lessons we're teaching by example to our children. As the kids minister here at Gracious Savior Church, I'm particularly sensitive to this one. And man, I hope that I'm the kind of parent that sets a good example for my kids. Or are we actually being a bad example to our spouse, to our friends, to the people we work with? What kind of compromises are we making? And some of you are like, believe me, I know the compromises I've made and I'm stuck in a cycle. Or someone I love is stuck in a cycle that seems impenetrable. What happens? What do we do? How do we respond to that cycle once we've discovered it? Remember thing number one, remember the hope you have in Jesus. Here's the thing. In those cycles, we are tempted to do what is right in our own eyes. Just like the Israelites in the book of Judges. We're tempted to try to change history or correct the past according to our own interpretation of what's right and wrong. The Bible calls us to abandon that. Abandon it. In those days, Israel had no king. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Us Americans, we're uncomfortable with the idea of a king, someone telling us what's right and wrong, who also holds a lot of political power in our life. But we have a king. It doesn't matter what country or generation you're from. You have a king, and his name is Jesus. And he knows what's right. And he wants to help you accomplish that and break out of the cycle. In fact, he's so committed to getting you out of the cycle that he died on a cross for your sin. He died on a cross to suck out the cyclical compromises, the sins, the behaviors, the murder, the depression that exists in all of our lives. And he brings it to the grave with him when he dies. When he rises up to, again, he's free of it. And he wants you to be the same. 
That's what King Jesus does for us. That's what he does for you. And that's what he offers us. And as Christians, that's how we can respond to a tragedy. Like this book or a tragedy in our own life. By remembering the man who deserved no tragedy and took all the tragedy of the world onto himself. He has the power to break you out of the cycle. But the thing is, is we have to make him the king. When we decide what's right or wrong in our own eyes, we wear a little crown around. Do, 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 do. But when we make Jesus our king and let him decide what's right and wrong, we take off the crown and we put it on him. And he makes a much better king than you or I. This isn't an easy process or an easy commitment. It's very difficult. We can buy into it for a while and buy out and get stuck in a whole new cycle of religiosity. But the thing is, is the king wants to help us and he can help us through faith. He wants to give you faith to trust in him. He wants to give you faith to trust him as he delivers you out of the cycles in your life. And he wants to do so with grace and love. He is well aware of the tragedies in your life. He's experienced quite a few of them on, of his own. But he wants to deliver you from a cycle of depravity. However, as the book of Judges tells us, what causes the cycle? We do. When we become our own king. So no matter how many times it takes, or how hard it is, just know your faith in Christ is so worth it and you'll never be put to shame by taking off your crown and putting it on Jesus and saying, I don't wanna do what's right in my eyes, I wanna do what's right in yours. So let's take a moment to pray for the faith that we need to break out of the cycle and create a new cycle of making Jesus our King every day. Father in heaven, you have witnessed every tragedy and you have responded to those tragedies by giving us King Jesus who died for us. By responding to that tragedy, you give us a way of escape. We don't have to be in this cycle of hopelessness and depravity. We don't have to contribute to being our own worst villain, like so many Shakespearean characters. Instead, we can trust in you. We can trust in you totally and completely. But this is a huge task, far too great for us on our own. We need your spirit to give us faith, to give us the ability to have unwavering confidence in you, unquestioning loyalty to your crown and your kingdom. And this is done through prayer. So we stand here, Father, asking by your Holy Spirit to give us the faith we need to follow you today. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, for life everlasting. And may he give you the faith required to break out of the judge's cycle, to stop doing what's right in our own eyes, and stop saying we have no king or putting the crown on us, May he give you the faith to put the crown on it.
keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Don't laugh! <laughs> I, I know! 